Hi, Rupert. Hey, Lenny. How you doing? We're standing out in freezing cold weather yep. uh, to welcome everybody to our concert today. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the concert? Well, uh, we have a wonderful guitarist. Yeah. But I remember he used to be a cellist. Yeah, uh, uh, Oscar Summer Solo. Uh -huh. He came to Apple Hill, I don't know how many, just maybe three or four years ago, uh -huh. and he was a cellist. And he was a wonderful presence at Apple Hill. Yeah. But uh, a couple of years ago, he wrote to me and said he had won an international guitar competition <laughs> and he wanted to play at Apple Hill. So we had him come and play, and he was phenomenal. And so uh, we all thought it would be great to invite him to play this concert. He's going to play a beautiful program. Yeah, I believe it's um, uh, there's some Walton on the program and uh -huh. all of this. And, uh -huh. uh, and this really neat guitar that he just bought, oh, okay. apparently. It's an old guitar. It's kind of small, so I'm really looking forward to hearing oh, fantastic, it. Fantastic, yeah. fantastic. And then what else? We have, um, we have some wonderful Baroque cellos. Baroque uh, cellos. Yeah, yep, yep, um, with Jennifer Morris and Tim Merton. Both fabulous cellists, um, and um, this is the, 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 the top of their game, if you will. And Jennifer is an alum of Apple Hill. I think she was Apple Hill when she was in her teen, her teen years. Yep. And I knew Tim from Marlboro and from Rattleboro, so I've known him for, for many, many years, too. Yeah, it's so, great. It's quite funny because it's uh, it'll be a concert of reunions in a way because yeah. Jennifer and I go back to graduate school together. Ah. We, had, we were in the same cello studio. Did you both get your doctorates together? Uh, yeah, pretty much yeah. around that yeah, time. Rupert is a doctorate, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yep, yeah, so I first met Jennifer for when I was in grad school yeah um, and then found out that she was a Apple Hiller yeah. many years later yeah awesome so. well they have a great concert you know all our concerts are really fantastic so we're asking everybody to please donate for a concert we like to give these concerts make them free for everybody but we're suggesting everybody please please donate uh, to watch this concert right yeah yeah, yeah. every bit counts and yeah. and it's always going to a great cause and yeah so enjoy everybody enjoy the concert see you later
In northern Italy, one of the most noteworthy early Baroque composers of keyboard music was Gerolamo Frescobaldi, 1583-1643. to His output heavily influenced the likes of Henry Purcell, um, Froberger, and of course Johann Sebastian Bach. In 1628, Frescobaldi published an important collection of 35 canzoni, or canzonas, and this is his only volume of ensemble music for one to four instruments plus basso continuo. Canzonas were derived from the pre-existing French chanson of the 16th century, and eventually it moved towards an independent instrumental work, uh, in, independent from the vocal work, and uh, Frescopaldi used this as a template for the variety of invention. And you'll hear in this canzona that we're playing that it changes um, rapidly from section to section and it's very fragmented. That's quite a 17th century manner of instrumental music. It doesn't have antecedent and consequent phrases like you find in classical music. And it's really quite fantasy-like and it has, um, it's brimming with energy, with ideas. So typical of this genre, Frescobaldi added these names to the canzoni. Often they were about characters or places. He spent most of his um, career in Rome. Mm.
The earliest solo compositions written specifically for the violoncello are directly linked to the great innovation in string making between 1660 and 1690 in Northern Italy, when metal wound gut strings became introduced. So we are playing on Baroque cellos and our strings are made of sheep gut. And then as you can see, our lower string, well, my G is still a pure gut string, but the C is wound gut with silver and Tim's as well. I'm playing on an instrument from 1724. Uh, I'm playing on one from 1750, yeah. except that this cello hasn't been uh, sort of converted as totally to a Baroque instrument. You can see the fingerboard is longer. It's, it's, a, it's sort of a modern cello. Yeah. And the bows are, um, actually they're both made by the same person. Right, um, Louis Bejean, yes. Yeah, and they're, they've got a different shape. They're very simple. More convex, yeah. yeah. In the city of Bologna, um, there was a growing circle of pioneering cellists who brought their creative talents to the fore and helped to give the cello its um, solid foundation. And so this was hand in hand with the string innovation because it made the, the pitch more reliable. So the cello started becoming more dependable as an instrument. The local duke, Francesco II in Bologna, or nearby in, in Padua, I should say, he was himself a cellist or a keen instrumentalist, and so it was nice to have him as a patron. And we're going to play this wonderful canon by Domenico Gabrielli. It's in the very true style of a canon. He wrote it one line on the manuscript, and one person starts, and then the next person starts a measure later. <laughs> Francois Couperin, his name is synonymous with the especially rich heritage of the French Baroque music. He was known as Couperin Le Grand, the most important member of his very musical family. They had a long dynasty in the French courts system. And he lived in an era when the arts were lavishly funded in every respect at the Sun King Louis XIV's court. He became organist at the Saint-Gervais in Paris at the age of 12, and then he was later appointed as the organist du Chapelle du Roi, so he was the main court composer for Louis, 
the 14th. And it was there um, that he composed these concerts royaux, or the goût réuni, which means taste reunited. And what he's trying to do in this piece is reunite the very different aspects of Italian and French style, national styles of music. So you'll hear us playing more en égal, which is very French, but the Italian is a little more um, bravura-like and sonata-like. So he's trying to bring these two schools together. En égal, if you don't know what it means, it's, it's, uh, it's where the 60s notes, they swing a little bit, ta-da, 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 like that, and the Italians are much more square. Yeah, or, yeah, they have a very different approach, like in their cooking. It's very much like that. <laughs> <laughs> this 13th concert is composed for two bass instruments at the unison. So it could work on two viola da gambas, two bassoons, or two cellos, like we're going to play them. And he writes very specific ornaments in our parts. And he even has an explication at the very beginning of the volume as to how to execute all of these various ornaments. And while it's very um, controlled writing in a way, it's also full of fantasy. And you'll hear that hopefully in this performance. It's, uh, for me, this is, I haven't done much Baroque French music. And um, so it's a challenge, this, this little language of these ornaments and it's not easy to get right off but um, it's fascinating and it really he's written it all out and it, it really makes a big difference to how you play it. Thank you. 
Thank you.